This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers. Hey everyone, this is the East Hampton City Council Ordinance Subcommittee meeting for April 23rd, it's 6 p.m. I um, want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I We have some people who can't be here long, so we're kind of going to just jump into this conversation um, right, right now, but we're going to talk about the... Um, um, the supplemental the specialized code. the specialized code. I have I just read stretch code, and I was like, that's not it. Um, so the specialized code, um, the opt-in specialized code, actually, uh, which is in addition to what we already have in terms of the stretch code. Um, so we have a number of people here who have interest in. Um, the specialized code. And so we just want to kind of continue that conversation. Uh, Connie Dawson, who was a part of the Energy Advisory Committee, gave a presentation last week about what this um, um, opt-in uh, code would mean and kind of what that would look like. And then invited folks from um, both the city, um, we uh, invited some folks who this impacts directly. Um, and we also have Connie here as well. And we have Cassie, who is our um, um, conservation agent. Yes, great. So we'd like to have this, yeah, uh, start this conversation. Um, so do people have questions? Well, let's just start here because we've also asked Cassie to give a presentation and discuss how this is going to benefit the city um, in terms of work that we're doing around um, the um, oh boy, climate, action plan. climate action plan. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so, but first of all, are there any questions that folks have about the um, opt-in code right now in terms of questions about it that we can try to answer or maybe concerns about it if we're already familiar with it so that we can begin to kind of just jump right into this conversation. Um, I, I have a question. This is Peter. Sure. Sure. Yes. Good, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Peter Serafino with uh, Home City Development. We're working with Mike Michon on 11 Ferry Street. And I guess, I mean, I have a number of questions, but the first question is what What are you all anticipating as a time frame for uh, adoption of the uh, uh, of the uh, specialized development? As, as a developer who's got a project that's trying to get started and is in design, um, that's kind of a critical uh, critical question for me. Yep, so I think that um, there are a number of things that are happening within the city that this, I'm not sure where we disappeared to, but um, that this is an opportunity for the city so that if we move relatively quickly on this, it opens up opportunities for us to apply for some grants. Um, and I think that's the kind of biggest kind of thing that we're now recognizing that this is something that really opens up the opportunity for that. However, if we were to adopt this um, this evening, hypothetically, uh, it would go to the next city council meeting. And then um, there's actually a six month. Wait. Yeah, my understanding is that um, that it doesn't go into effect for six months, according to the state. I don't know if there if that's absolutely a mandate, but that's certainly they're reckon the state recommends a six month waiting period so that developers and municipal employees can get up to speed. Um, it's not as complicated a change as the stretch code has been, uh, but there certainly are some things that um, people need to, you know, just 
learn about and, and figure out. Okay, thank you. So, so if a building permit application was submitted to the city <clears throat> prior to, let's, let's say that the uh, specialized code takes effect as of January 1, 2025, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, for instance, let's say Home City Development submits a, a building permit application for a 96 unit uh, residential building at, at 11 Ferry Street in, in November or December. Um, does that then get grandfathered in under the current um, current rules, current uh, uh, code? I'm sorry. My understanding is that um, if if the permit is accepted by the city and you know and you have the, a green light before it goes into effect, then you you whatever was in effect at the time the permit was given is is. That's those are the codes that you have to meet. Is that all right? That's that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. BJ, do you have? Thoughts? That's the standard for any time we adopt a new. You know, like we're trying, we have been trying to do the 2021 international code. We're currently in the 2015. When it, let's say, for hypothetically, if I accepted it today, and there's a six month grace period. It's always sort of a standard that's been established because as you stated, it needs, you know, people need time to sort of wrap their head around it and understand what it's about. Right. But the stretch code is in fact right now. Yes, it is. Yes. We have three codes now here in the state. Right. Yes. We right. have the base, the base energy set. code, right. The stretch, stretch. code. Yeah. And now the opt in and code. the specialized code. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mike. So, so I guess the question is, um, you know, our, our engineers and our HERS raters have actually um, asked us to kind of, because we don't really know what's going to happen with the new change of the code and how that's going to be implemented with this opt-in code. There seems to be a gray area from what they're telling me. Again, don't quote me on this, but if, if, it, if it changes drastically, it could cause significant costs to us right now um, at the infantile stage. You know, if this if this was if this was kind of like further in after the new code change, there would be more time for everybody to get really up to speed. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the specialized code is actually has that many changes in terms of what you have to do that the stretch code has. I mean, the stretch code completely changed the game, but the specialized code, I mean, the primary things about the specialized code, well, let me just leave this, um, are, um, you know, there's nothing changes for additions, alterations, or renovations. Um, if it's all electric construction, no changes. Um, you still can, can use fossil fuels. Um, um, although the HERS numbers change, that one of the big issues is you have to pre-wire for all electric as you build in, in this um, stretch code. And, and the rationale for that is that that will mean that the retrofits in the future will be pretty simple and, and not very expensive. That's, that's really why um, people are very enthusiastic about that piece of the stretch code. <laughs> Specialized code. I'm sorry. <laughs> spec sorry. <laughs> we didn't both begin with S. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then the other, th the, the big change is um, if you're building a multifamily housing construction that's over 12,000 square feet, then um, they have to meet passive house standards, which is a big change. But it's it's not new. I mean, that's that is in the stretch codes as well, the whole information about passive house. Okay. Julie, you had your hand up. Hi, I'm Julie Scannell. I uh, represent the community builders. We have a, a project in early development in East Hampton. Um, uh, the, I want to kind of echo what Mike is saying. Uh, the the cost between the opt-in stretch code and typical stretch code communities, which we do a lot of work in, is actually really impacts, especially the work I, I do as a 100% affordable developer. The, the opt-in stretch code is in, it really exceeds the design standards that the Commonwealth puts out for us in the competitive resource environment that we exist in. And so the community is asking us to design and build to an even higher standard than that. 
in today's environment is is really concerning um, just because we, you know, everyone knows the cost of building is 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 high and the cost of building affordable housing is, ex is exceptionally high. Um, I'm also really concerned about um, opt-in stretch code for rehabs of buildings um, because there's even less resources for us to preserve existing affordable housing. Excuse me, I'm going to have a dog barking in the background. Um, so uh, to need to do, if, if, if the level of rehab that we would do at existing affordable housing properties would, would trigger needing to comply with the opt-in stretch code, that would make that work almost exclusively cost prohibitive given the, the environment that there's not a lot of money out there from the state for preservation at this time. My understanding is that rehabs, unless there's an, a huge addition as well, are not affected by the... Um, it depends on what you're doing, right? If you're just like replacing flooring, you're right, it wouldn't trigger that. But if you're if you're needing like systems upgrades or doing a certain level, and I'm sorry, I'm not a technical person, I'm a finance person, but um, I would, but when I talk about this with my colleagues, if, if we were doing a certain level, like a and I'm not even going to say it because I'm going to say it wrong, but a certain level of rehab, uh, if the opt-in stretch code is, is it in existence in that community, then we would need to comply with that. So I, 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 it, it's unfortunate the terminology is so similar. Are you talking about the stretch code? The opt-in stretch code. Opt-in code. Okay. Um, you know, I think it would be useful for us to have someone come and speak uh, because I, this this is not the information that I have. Right. Right. Um, from architects that I've spoken to about this, that um, rehabs should not be affected by this. It, maybe so, those additions that... If it's helpful, and maybe you can expand on this. My understanding is there's the base code, there's the current stretch code, which is undergoing a change. The current stretch code has new factors that are coming into effect in July that are happening no matter what, because we already have the stretch code. But they're going to be pretty in, ex extensive, what mm -hmm. those changes are. And then what we're discussing here tonight is the opt-in specialized code, not a set call. I'm just concerned to call it the opt-in stretch code if that's right. It's confusing. confusing. I mean, all of these are very confusing and we really stay in each lane to understand the progress or the, or the understand each sort of department mm -hmm. of, of these, of this energy code. It's an energy code with three different sort of chapters. Right. Maybe that's right. a good analogy. Right. And it can be confusing, but I don't think that any time the intent was to make it cost prohibitive or financial burden. And you also have to remember, like with rehab, you're in a, the, the, pre -ex the uh, existing building code mm -hmm. and, and what level of renovation or rehabbing you're doing puts you in a different tier. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pieces that go together then to the stretch code. So Yes, there is cost involved, but I don't think the intent was ever to make it a cost prohibitive. Right. But, but yes, yeah. yep, Tamara. Hi, I'm just trying to take notes and I need everyone to repeat their names. Um, I see you on the screen, but I'm it's it's a little hard to clearly see everyone. So for the last person who's speaking with the white sleeves, can you just tell me your name? I'm BJ Church, the building commissioner. Okay, I'm sorry, I just can't see. And, and right next to you. Hi, I'm Cassie Traggart, the conservation agent. Okay. And the, the other question that I had, um, I didn't mean to jump in, but I'm getting behind on the notes and I needed to um, get in there, is that, um, Connie, would you mind um, sending me a link so that I can embed a link into the notes for this ordinance meeting? So if someone wanted to look more about these three distinct codes, they oh, would be able to see them side by side. I just think that would be very helpful. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'll send a link to the, um, the, the Massachusetts, um, I think it's the DOER has a, a website. Is it DOER? Yeah, that's what I Yeah, have. so I'll send, I'll send, or you can send that to her right now if you want. And just to be clear, when she said Connie, she was talking about you. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. People confused. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I should have been more formal, counselor. All right. All right. Those, those, I just wanted to make sure I was getting that down. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Yeah, that's two for one. Um, so a couple, uh, I just have a couple thoughts. Uh, I just want to make sure. Um, so it sounds like we have a little bit of confusion around the opt-in specialized versus stretch, the changes that are happening in stretch. 
um, changes that are happening in stretch are out of our purview. Those are happening regardless of what we do here. Yes. So that's number one. Um, the op the opt-in specialized code is a is a higher level um, that, from my understanding, uh, would primarily impact um, solar on on buildings. New construction. On new construction. New construction is is a really important piece here. It's so, only new construction. And that's fine. I just want to yeah. just kind of lay out some of the pieces here. And then, um, you know, pre-wiring electrical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, But it sounded like those, those were the two main items that we had ta previously talked about. It sounds like there might be a change in the HERS level in certain okay. things. And, which, and, and I think that I would like to ask Mike and maybe Peter or, you know, if they, if they are more understanding of the HERS certification and the, the projected cost, if that changed for a project like Ferry Street. I think we have to be really careful here, knowing that we have Ferry Street, knowing that we have the school um, buildings that are going to be, you know, on they're slated, um, that we don't do something inadvertently that is going to impact those projects in a negative way. Those are too important for the city, right? Like I'm, and and so as we as we think about this, I don't think that. Um, I don't think that we necessarily need to say, no, we're never going to do this. But I think that with those projects in mind, we have to be super careful and we might want to adopt it with a, a, a different, um, not a six month. Uh, well, you know, can I just that. say though, that, uh, this is a, th these questions come up every time a city or town um, starts talking about passing the specialized code. And um, there, um, there are people who have, Evaluate. In fact, the state has a report about whether and what the actual expenses are of um, completing these new in, new buildings using the highest level of code. And what they're saying is that, but if you include the uh, incentives that are available, that the differential is none or very small, like one or two percent. So I'm obviously not someone who can talk the details of this, but I feel like there is a lot of um, information being spread that is not accurate. And once again, I think, you know, the, the report by the DOER that breaks down the expenses, I assume is valid information. Um, uh, so I just wanted to also say that. Can I, can I weigh in? Just sure. Peter yeah. again. Yeah. Right. So in the case of 11 Ferry Street, um, you know, we've designed a 96 unit all electric building. Uh, we've submitted our first um, one stop funding application to the state for the affordable housing resources we need for it. Um, we designed it. Uh, we, we told the state and we've been headed down the road of designing for uh, Energy Star certification and zero energy ready homes. Um, it's going to have solar, it's going to have electric vehicle charging stations. So it meets a lot of those same characteristics that the specialized code, which it I does. interpret basically mandating passive house. So <clears throat> yes, that's true. It sounds like in, yours. In my case, it, yeah, just it, in, our, in case of the Lem Ferry that Mike and I are working on, it, it, it basically means we have to change what we're doing and go the passive house route. Now, I, I've got a passive house building under construction in the town of Pelham right now. And Actually, we have two buildings there. One is being built to Energy Star standards and one is being built to Passive House standards um, for reasons I won't get into. But our, our assumption is that when, when they're operational, those two buildings are going to be almost equally as beneficial, that the cost savings, you know, having reached Energy Star standards as opposed to reaching Passive House standards are probably going to be fairly minimal. So the reason I'm not, enthralled with the idea of having to build this property for passive houses that I've gotten, you know, a good bit down the road. We're in the construction drawing phase. Yeah. Um, and it now means I've got to back up and go get registered with passive house Institute of us and, and get design certified. And so there's, there's some front end and then some back end certification and compliance requirements. And then of course, there's all the physical, you know, insulation and windows and, um, air sealing techniques that have to happen during construction. So it, it's considerable. And can I put a number on it? No, I, I can't. And and I'm, I'm certainly not debating the accuracy of the DOR 
DOER um, um, studies, but it's it's it adds time and it adds process and it and it definitely adds cost. So um, certainly, I cost you to redo your your plans at the stage. I can see how that would definitely add costs to the project, which would be really unfortunate, of course. Yeah. So may I ask you um, what you think your time frame is? Like, when do you think you are going to have? Right. So, I mean, if, if, if I weren't thinking about passive house, I would probably, I would have uh, construction drawings ready for a uh, building permit application before the end of this year. Okay. Now, the other, but that doesn't mean that I'd be able to start in the first quarter of next year or even the first half of next year because I still have to wait for the affordable housing resources uh, to come through from the state. So, um, and and best case scenario, that's you know this time next year. So, um, it, it is a little difficult for me to for me to say. But I have to figure out: or do I try to go in for a building permit application this year, or do I back up and try to you know, go passive house. Uh, but, you know, yeah. so, uh, that, that's a, the dilemma I'm in. Yeah. The, 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 the other part, the other part too, is let me, let me just jump in here with, with Peter. So uh, Peter and I are on building 11 and then I have building nine, uh, building seven, which I'm hoping we're going to start <clears throat> this fall. Um, you know, and if we don't start this fall, it'll be spring. So, you know, we're we're already hit with, Obviously, the interest rates, you know, our money is usually between three and actually two and a half and three and a half percent. Here we are at seven. And then I'm going to use the example of going from a double double glaze window to a triple glaze window. And on, 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 on buildings that are this size, that's that's huge. And that's just one component. You know, you, you take that and you telegraph that through the entire project and, you're, you know, you're adding on unfortunately millions of dollars and you know being in western mass we can only afford so much with tenant bases um so it's a struggle it's a it's a big big struggle and i, th I think the i think the the scary part is you know with the new stretch code coming out in july a lot a lot of our engineers and our hers raters know what's in potentially going to be in the code but i don't think maybe bj you can be clear could have more clarity on this but i don't think we know 100 percent what is going to be in that code so you know when you add another layer on like this opt-in and, and i would love to support the city in any of this that you do but because we don't know exactly how that's going to affect us financially it's hard for us to to be part of that but go, but go ahead B, bj do you do you understand what Mike, are you trying to put me on the hot seat? Yeah. <laughs> I think you're on the hot seat. You know, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think, you know, we can't even get our, our next 2021, you know, code and our 10th edition uh, finally signed off. So to be clear on what everything is going to be when it all irons out and, and, and I couldn't say, I, I, not, I, I wouldn't want to until it's here. Right. And I, and I, I can appreciate that. And I think that's where... That's why, you know, our engineers, our HERS raiders, myself, Peter, <clears throat> are nervous about this because we don't, if we knew what was going to happen, we could address it, but we don't know what's going to happen. So it's, it's, you know, we don't want to have a, stale, a stalled project here in our city. That's for sure. So, so can I just ask a one quick clarifying question? So I don't know what Energy Star, how that relates to HERS rating. Like what, what is that rating? What is, what does that mean? What does that translate to? It's a it's a high performing um, building, and it you know I, again I'm like Julia I'm more on the finance and development side, and not on the technical side of it. Um, so I, I can't necessarily. I mean, you know, we have a a like with a passive house building, there is a hers rater who comes in at the end and and does lower door tests and other tests and complete certain checklists that. Uh, then get submitted, I think, in uh, to uh, for energy for Energy Star certification. So it'll have a uh, seal of approval uh, that it meets, um, you know, certain energy standards. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's like I say, I, you know, very similar operationally on the operation operating standpoint to to Passive House. Okay. Okay. 
I, you know, I, at, at, at ten years ago, we all thought everything was going to be was going to be lead certification, and and right. you know, and now it's now it's passive house, and then ten years from now, we don't know. So that's why, uh, uh, this uh, in terms of affordable housing uh, development, uh, the state uh, executive office of housing and livable communities has been flexible as to what standard of energy certification you're going to meet, and mm -hmm. and they, you know, they'll. They want us to meet something, at least it's on new construction, but they're flexible as to whether it's Energy Star, Stretch Code, Passive House. Um, you know, certainly things are trending in the direction of all electric. They don't want to see applications that, you know, new new construction using fossil fuels. And we get that and we're addressing that, but they're not dictating one route or another. Okay. Yeah. I was just trying. I didn't understand what that meant. So, okay. That's helpful. just a rating system, really. It's just a rating. I mean... So, you know, it just all depends on how you interpret it, but it really is just a rating system. Mm -hmm. the energy but system. classic houses do require like the, the, the buildings be tighter. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they, that also means that there has to be a way to get the air flowing in and out so that, you know, you, you, you can't have, just, to have a mechanical fan. That yeah. And so, so, I mean, there so are certain, and that's mm -hmm. why the, the windows have to be triple pane to get that tightness. So, I mean, it, it is, a higher requirement. You know what I'm curious about, Peter, is if you were starting from scratch, if you didn't already have your plans, it sounds like almost done. Do you think it would be more expensive to build passive? I mean, what based, based, based on my experience in, in Pelham, yes, it would be. But, you know, it, it's just with between the inflationary, you know, inflation we're experiencing and with the additional um, you know, physical requirements of building to this higher standard, it would be, I mean, would, and, and the problem for us uh, on the affordable end of things is that there aren't additional resources coming to us from our funders to say, hey, you're building passive house, you get X amount more. I mean, there are some incentives that we do get. There's a little bit of feasibility study money. There's some incentive money at the end, but um, it doesn't really offset the additional cost. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm looking I at the OER and it Energy isn't even on here, right? So that's why I'm trying to figure that out. So, well, but Julia, the energy isn't. Yeah, so I've, I've I've developed Passive House, and our, our project in East Hampton at 385 Main is designed to Passive House and all electric standards already. Oh, um, so um, the guidance I've received on the opt-in specialized code is that it's basically net zero, so that is an excess of the already high energy standards that, that we're planning our project on because our project is, is further down the road than Peter's is. Um, it, so I think just it, it gives us the flexibility by not having the, the opt-in specialized code because of the resource environment that affordable housing developers work in. It gives us the flexibility to, you know, not have to do one thing or the other or plan for something later down the line um, by not being, you know, locked into absolutely having to do that. Um, you know, I've, I've developed Passive House and it is, it, it is more expensive. There are incentives out there. They're starting to go away a little bit. They said there's probably, there probably more out there four or five years ago. Um, and we're not seeing the savings on the operational front uh, as maybe someone who has a Passive House single family home might see um on on the scale of our operations so far at tcb we you know it, we have a high level of standard and none of our passive house buildings uh perform uh maybe as we had hoped you know the, one of the things about the um specialized code is the whole issue of pre-wiring which i do think with new construction is something that it's legitimate to require simply because it's very, it will be very expensive yeah. in the future if retrofitting has to occur and that pre-wiring isn't there. Yeah, I, I, I see, I really see, I, again, I, I want to really want to support the city's initiative on this. Um, and I, I don't see that as impacting affordable housing developers because as Peter said, um, we're really required to be all electric from uh, this, from the Commonwealth side of it already. So any new construction we would be doing would be all electric. So that aspect of it isn't worrisome to me. Well, the, the issue is the passive housing, if I understand. The issue well, is the requirements yeah. for larger construction. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Tamara, you had your I, 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 th I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, is as we start to push the envelope <clears throat> with, with this new state-of-the-art energy codes, we're also pushing it with products. So in other words, we're a premium product, like a triple glazed window that's not used 
day to day, that manufacturer is charging a premium. It's the same thing with the mechanical equipment. If you're getting into a certain specific mechanical equipment for these super tight buildings, instead of going like with a Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi mini split, you're going into these VRF uh, units, which are again, hybrid state of the art over the top units. Mm -hmm. they're charging a premium so and as a developer we're not we're not reaping any there's no benefit to us to do that so we're at a loss mm -hmm. can I hand up mm -mm. I didn't mean to sorry <laughs> <clears throat> so um, I appreciate the the folks that are on the call with us given that perspective yeah I think w one of the 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 pieces that's missing from this is we don't have the developers for the, the schools mm -hmm. um, present. And and I think, you know, from being on the, the developer selection committee, um, the margins were super tight mm -hmm. um, for the reuse of the schools. Reusing those buildings is, is not easy. Um, and they, they all pledged to basically do um, net zero construction. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems that if this would affect these folks, then it would probably affect the schools as well. Mm -hmm. So again, I just, I think that we should go into this as informed as we possibly can. Sure. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's like my, my, the reason why I would be supporting this is because I want to support, um, you know, green construction. I want to support, you know, getting away from fossil fuels. I want to support a, a, a healthier East Hampton across the board. But if it sounds like what our developers are doing are already at a super high level, and so they're accomplishing a lot of the goals that we would want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. It's just that like what Mike just said, it like really resonated. Like I, I understand when you have to buy specialized stuff, they're not creating as much of that. They're going to charge a premium, Sure, you know, and that that's a, that's a legitimate concern. Yeah, I agree. Right? Right. For the new, for the new, school redesigns are they planning to demolish those buildings entirely no, no, so my understanding is that the often specialized code doesn't apply to existing structures yeah unless you're trying to redo them to a certain eclipse it says here mm -hmm. um i mean they would be complete says, cut jobs they would just leave the, the shell no the shell, it basically. says improvements this is okay so this is from a frequently asked question just simple presentation i got from doer our regional coordinator um and it says that improvements to existing structures, depending on size, are regulated by the updated stretch code and base code. Okay. We already so, really, you know, once we went, we got the base code, the stretch code, it really has taken it to the next level. And I know right. that as a state, you know, that Mass has a very aggressive, I think, goal to be net zero by 2050. And I think that <laughs> they were, I, you know, with the base code, energy code and then the stretch code, I really think it got us going there. And I, I, I think, you know, again, I, I don't get any vote. I'm just saying that, mm -hmm. you know, the opt-in again is sort of, I, I think it has been said here more for that new, completely new building and making sure that it's wired and it's ready for these things that are coming. Mm -hmm. yeah, my understanding is, an, and, you know, obviously, we should double check this is that as long as it's a renovation, the specialized code does not tr is not triggered. I'd also like while we're talking about the reasons why it would be useful for the city, I wish you would talk about how it would affect our being able to become a um, climate leader city. Is that the yeah. right term? So yeah. for that, yeah. that, that I'm happy to yeah. talk about yeah. because yeah. I think that's a big argument. So one yeah. of the I appreciate the information that everyone's given, and I think it's all important to for the consideration. Um, the piece that I wanted to come talk about, just to add for, for the consideration, is that um, there is a new designation that the city could go for called, called being a climate leader community. Basically, there's green communities, which we already are. One of the criteria for that is having the stretch code, which we already have. Um, but if we wanted to get this this kind of new designation of a climate leader community, we would need to have adopted the opt-in specialized code. The reason that we would want to do that potentially uh, would be that it would open us up for a broader spectrum of grant opportunities. The green communities designation, the, that opens us up to grants through the green communities program. Those grants though are specific to improvements to municipal buildings and operations that reduce. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, 
that reduce fossil fuel emissions uh, in those municipal buildings and operations, like updating the HVAC system within a wastewater treatment plant, or uh, we were able to use the, the grant program to get the electric vehicles for the police department and things like that. Um, what did you say about the police? I couldn't hear that. Oh, I'm sorry. The, one of the grants that we got using the Green Communities Program uh, grant program are were electric vehicles for the police department oh, to okay. use in their fleet. Yeah, and so we can... Those aren't publicly available. They're used by municipal operations. Um, the climate leader community designation would open us up to a broader spectrum of grants uh, that include different things like a money for a, a photovoltaic array or geothermal um, improvements to municipal buildings, um, more things related to climate impacts in terms of resiliency and not just that fossil fuel reduction that we need to meet through green communities and our annual reporting through that. Uh, so it's just a, a broader scope of opportunities. Um, it also would align us with the state's goals for other broader grant opportunities like MVP grants and things like that. That would be a good thing to be able to say, hey, we're also meeting this requirement. We're clearly committed to this goal. Um, and the bigger, biggest piece is that I think that would be really helpful when we complete the climate action plan. If we meet this designation, if we're able to get this designation, we'll be able to execute a lot of the actions identified in that plan, likely through this grant program that's going to become available. Um, the timelines associated with that would be that the first round of going to get this designation is the application deadline is July 25th. We wouldn't have to have the opt-in code in, uh, effective by that time, we would just have to have it proved to be um, adopted. And then the set effective date would be what I'm seeing here would be six to 12 months after adoption is what they typically re recommend. So um, that being said, so that would be best case scenario, in, in my opinion, if we're thinking just about executing a climate action plan, because we're hoping to finish the plan, you know, this summer. And then if we have this designation, we can be right up at the front to try to go for some of the grants, start executing executing those actions. That won't be the last chance to try to become a climate leader community though. It's a rolling thing just like green communities is. The next opportunity would be in December. Um, and this opt-in, adopting this opt-in specialized code is one piece of what we would need to do to meet all the criteria to go for that designation. The other criteria are um, having an advisory, an energy advisory committee, which we already have, um, issuing a formal commitment to be a net zero carbon emitting city by 2050, which the climate action plan will will um, satisfy that require that commitment requirement. Um, we have to have a roadmap for municipal buildings reaching that standard as well by 2050 through the climate action plan. That will be an appendix to it, including that information for municipal buildings explicitly. And then the other one is adopting an updated uh, zero zero emission first policy for vehicles, which basically is just gives a more structured hierarchy to an existing fuel efficient policy that we have in the city ordinance. Um, and so that is also in the works, something that I've been talking to the energy advisory committee about. And um, those, the other pieces I think are, in my opinion, are easier to get done. Some of them already are done. This is kind of like the big piece that we don't have to go for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, it's just something to consider about how it kind of fits into our broader climate goals and things that we could hopefully try to get done with that. Um, and so my opinion is that I'd be in support of us passing it so we can go for it in July 25th. But, you know, I appreciate everyone's points here that have been made already. So, and, and what are, and, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. My name is Cassie Traggart. Cassie I'm the conservation Traggart. agent. Yes. Okay. Connie, I know that Mike has his hand open. Yep. He's okay. Mike, sorry. Just letting so, so uh, uh, Cassie, that was one of my questions. So, so I, I, I'm sorry, I missed the previous meeting, which probably talked about deadlines. So your deadline for this application is July. Is, is it roll, Is it a rolling application or is it dead at, at July? It's got to be July. There's basically going to be different rounds into the future that the city can go for. So similar to green communities, as many cities can become green communities still to this day when they finally meet those criteria. So um, the first round, if we wanted to go for the first round, the deadline to apply and, and Prove that we've met all these criteria would be July 25th. And so um, the next round would come available in December. I don't know the exact date yet. I don't, I don't know that they come out with the exact date yet for the next round. Um, so certainly the opportunity is not going to go away. Uh, but I do think that the only additional reason that the 
you know, the city council might consider trying to go for for July 25th is that it would it would align quite nicely with the finishing of the climate action plan to us kind of use that momentum to keep going um, with those actions that are identified in there. And, and I, I think you said that we could adopt it with a, a, like a uh, effective date and still be eligible for those grants. That's that is what I've confirmed Six with the, with the regional coordinator from DOER is that what the criteria that needs to be satisfied by July twenty fifth would just be the city council adopting it and setting an effective date, um, which again, yeah, could be six to twelve months based off of the recommendation of of um, DOER. But I don't know if maybe we could potentially even have the effective date go out even further. I don't know what's allowed in that regard. And that's a federal grant. No, it's a state. The Department state. of Energy Resources is so a state. Mass state. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so that's, yeah, it's a, it's a state agency that creates the code for the state. And, and you know, Mike, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I just, excuse me. So I just wanted, you know, in, in a perfect world, if we could, my opinion only, if we could see, you know, what the new building code, this new change of the code would be, then we would all know what we have, you know, we have to do. Um, if, 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 if Cassie, if you're saying that you can apply for this in July and it won't affect anything to do with the energy code, uh, you know, again, I have to, have to read through this. I'm all for it. Uh, you know, I'd fully support the city in becoming green. That's what we, that's really what we should be doing. But if it's going to affect us and affect this, this code that could be detrimental, that's going to be a problem. Well, that's the thing. It, it the criteria is that we have the city council has adopted the specialized code, but it, yeah, the effective, it doesn't have to be effective by July 25th, just needs to have been adopted by July 25th. It has to, been, it has to have been, op, they have to have opted in at that point. They have to vote for it by then, even though there's right. a one before it goes into effect. Okay. So BJ, I'm going to put you in the hot seat again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Love so, it. I mean, in, in your years of doing this, I mean, how, when when you've seen a change in the code, and I know you, I know it's different all the time. But I mean, I mean, is this going to be, you know, July? You're saying July one. Is it going to be really July one? Is it going to be the end of the year? Is it going to be the following year? What I, I'm, are you referencing when it would take an effect? Correct. The new the new stretch code. Correct. Right. So if they adopt it on July 1st, there's always yep. still that grace period of six months. Usually that's the standard, Mike. Um, you know, again, I, I know we're talking certain items like the glass, you keep the triple pane and the additional cost of that. But really the base code and the script code have us so close. I, I know, again, just like your project, this is an existing building. I mean, you know, so again, if you're not venturing into that opt. You're already doing the inner base energy code and the stretch code. So, you know, I think it's hard to say. It really is hard to say how, again, I, I mean, when the stretch code came out, I had contractors saying, why are we doing this? What is this? You know, and, and I made a comment earlier that we were making it so tight then that we had to put a mechanical fan in our residential house to circulate right. the air because it was so tight. So, you know, there's always bumps along the road and I, I, I don't know how to efficiently answer your question. Right. Okay. So let me ask you this. So if you don't apply in July and you apply in December, what's the difference? Well, I think, I think what Cassie is trying to say is that we'd be ahead of it instead of behind. I mean, the longer we wait is sort of, things are going to fall off and we're not going to have that opportunity that we might've had being right at the gate and, and getting some of those grants I'm, or some of that money. I can expound on that a little better. I think that, so right now we're in the process of developing our climate action plan. We've kind of developed a little bit of a, of a, of a base of people who are interested in that process. Um, we've got programs that are projects and in, in, that are currently underway and about to be getting started. Um, you know, we haven't paused any of our other climate action projects because of, developing the plan. But once we have the plan finished, that would be uh, something that is supporting these existing projects. And if we are then immediately have availability of going into these um, grant opportunities that are kind of come out of the being a climate leader community, we would be able to just kind of keep that momentum going if it makes sense. Um, but yeah, in terms of explicit, you know, we would miss out on X, Y, Z. It's hard for me to say at this time, if we didn't, if we went for the second round in December. Um, but I think one thing I just want to highlight again is that 
under the existing stretch code, July in July of this year, there will be changes that are, will take effect that are not within our control. That is happening this July um, because DOER has changed the stretch code. So there's that piece. Uh, so that's coming in July either way. But but yeah, I see what you're saying with um, going for the opt-in now or not. I guess that that still is the question that I can't really ha- answer how it would affect the other projects. I have this information from DOER here that, you know, for, this is a very simple infographic, but it's basically saying for, yeah, for multi, if, I don't know if you want to share, if that, or you can't, you're not, but um, basically it says that for multifamily uh, buildings, new multifamily, new for multifamily buildings that are over four stories and over 12,000 square feet, if they're all electric, what the, the current standard is that they're HERS of 45 or a TEDI, a TEDI or passive house. If we pass the opt-in specialized code, the new standard would be only passive house. For that, for those new, new. four plus story houses right. over 12,000 feet. If they are mixed fuel, they need to meet a HERS rating of 42 or a TEDI or a passive house currently. We get the opt-in specialized code, we would they would have to be passive house plus wiring for future electrification. So um, yeah, I don't know that, yeah, being net zero, I think is not something that I've seen. I know Julia mentioned that earlier. So, but again, that might be something that is a detail that. Well, the HERS rating and net zero, you know, if it's net zero, I imagine the HERS rating must be pretty low. Well, I'm saying here that, is that if you wouldn't, if we opted in the specialized code, you wouldn't have the HERS rating anymore. It'd be passive house. For depending new, on the size of the construction. For new multifamily. There's so many. There's like this spreadsheet. You've got to go, okay, there's column one. That's yeah. going to take me actually column, depending on what you're yeah. doing. Yep. You know, that's why this is so hard, I think, to explain. I am reading, rereading, and trying yes. to just get the interpretation down. Myself. I, I, I'm, a, agree, I'm in agreement, and that's why I, I just, it's really hard to make up, to support something that you truly don't know what's going to happen, because we don't know what's going to happen with our code. Well, we know what the what the specialized code is. That's No, that's, I, we know no, I understand. I, I'm we sorry. I, I understand that. It's just that the, the, the change in the building code. Yeah. I mean, another argument for, for the specialized code, of course, is that it also will reduce um, energy costs for the people living in these buildings. And, you know, if we're talking about low income, I mean, that that's one of the arguments. You know, all, the things that are in the specialized code were argued for to go into the stretch code when they were trying to build a stretch code and there was opposition from the previous administration. And that's why that that's why there, the opt-in code exists is because the previous administration refused to allow these to go into the current stretch code. So um, they're really just some tweaks to the stretch code. The stretch code is a huge change and God knows what they're going to do in in in, um, in July. But the changes that the opt-in code are making aren't as significant. Mm-hmm. So just, to, just so, again, so I'm clear. So with what's happening at Ferry Street, that's an existing structure. Right. It's so, one's existing and one's going to be new construction. Okay. okay. True. We okay. have okay. one of each. You even have a variable. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So that's helpful. Right. And then what's happening on Main Street, those are new structures. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then the schools. The <coughs> schools are. Existing. Are existing, existing structures. Even if it's if, even if you, it's shell, it's still an existing yeah. structure. Right. And, and are we 100% sure that this does not apply to existing structures of large sizes? That's what the DOER sizes? says. That's, what That's my saying. interpretation. Yeah. So That's what it says is no improve. It says, does the opt-in specialized code apply to existing structures? No. Improvements to existing structures, depending on size... That's the one. That, depending I don't know on what size, that means. Is, that's where I'm saying, are right. we 100% sure? Right. So that's what we're saying. Because depending on size, doesn't sound 100% sure. Right. Are regulated by updated stretch code and base code. So, so that's what I was saying earlier. We're already doing this in the code that we're in, in the in the energy base code and the stretch code. It, you know, I know this thing keeps coming up about size, but it's we're already there. We are already right. have a base code and a stretch code making us do these certain steps or for lack of a better word yeah, and so, so it, I, I think that is not a worry okay. I, I can you say in my can mind. you say that again so what you're saying is that the stretch code is is the is the place where the changes if you're doing a major renovation even though the shell still exists the stretch code is what 
is 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 in place and will have to be met. Those requirements will have to be met. But the specialized code is not adding on to what the stretch code is requiring. Correct. It says improvements to existing structures, depending on size, are regulated by the updated stretch code and which, base code, which is which are already in effect. Already right. in effect. Right. So That's so they if, so they will not be effective. So it shouldn't. That that size thing should it shouldn't matter. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. So just throw that out so the water. If, yeah, so it's only, only, it's only like new DJ, construction right? will be affected by the option. <laughs> right. yeah, so so your, new, your new construction, the new construction at Ferry Street would be affected mm -hmm. by his new the specialized building would be, code. Yeah, Mike's new building would be The affected. new, but not yes. the old, but Main but, Street also would be affected. Yes, yes. They would have to pre-wire. Okay. Let's get that permit in, Mike. <laughs> I'm sorry, BJ, I missed that. Let's get that permit in right now. <laughs> yes, well, believe me. <laughs> we're, we're thinking about it. Cameron, do you have a question? Yes, I had a question um, for Mike. I want to go back to something that you said in the beginning of our meeting. One of the things that you had said was that this could add uh, millions on in costs. And I was just wondering if you were just throwing that figure out or if this will literally cost you as a developer in the city millions more to the project that you already started. Well, and when you're talking about, so I'm going to, you know, so right now 11 ferry is, is approaching $50 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, originally seven ferry was like in like 25. Mm -hmm. It's now going to be 34. Mm -hmm. So because, when we say millions of, of dollars, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using, a broad brush. Yeah, it's the numbers are big, and, it, okay. and because of the because of the size of the buildings, it's just telegraphs through mm -hmm. exponentially. Yeah. So, I ha I have a couple other questions for clarification. Um, I'm hearing um, that you said that right now, because it would be a specialized product that it would really be marked up as you need this right now. Um, are, is there a possibility that if we waited the six months that that would see a decrease or is that too hard to be able to estimate? Who knows? I, I think, I mean, I think it's just like anything else. You know, when something mm -hmm. comes out that's state of the art, it's going to be a premium for a period of time until it mm -hmm. becomes just like big screen TVs, right? Mm -hmm. They were a premium at the beginning and now that you can buy them for $300. So okay. um, it's kind of that, that's a, a rough example. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Um, and then I, I had another question uh, specifically for Cassie. When you're talking about all of these different possible grants that could come up, I'm really having a hard time. I guess there's two different ones. There's the energy savings and our reputation as a, um, you know, a green city and all all of the things that comes with that. And then there's the financial aspect. So, the things that you mentioned that we could suddenly have aspect to building grants on is I, I don't have any concept of how large this is that you're talking about. And so to make a decision on the basis that we would have eligibility to be eligible for some grants, could you speak a little bit more to what does that mean for us? Sure. Um, well, one of the one of the problems is that they haven't come out with like the formal, this is what's in the grant. Uh, or what the grant options will be yet. I have the information that I've DOR has come out with lists a number of potential grant funding opportunities. Um, and so the first one is implementing climate leader best practices, uh, municipal building electrification and decarbonization, seed, seed funds for municipal clean energy slash climate coordinator. So that'd be a staff position. Support on for on-site solar PV and storage for existing buildings for new construction. Support for geothermal for existing buildings and new construction and other innovative projects. So it's not super clear what the grant opportunities will be. My the way that I that it's been explained to me in a more general sense is that green communities really the grants that come through that right now are quite limited in that they're focused on. Um, just reducing fossil fuel emissions within municipal buildings and operations, whereas this climate leader grant opportunity kind of starts getting into, um, you know, 
the, the things that I listed, obviously, but when it talks about innovative projects, you're thinking more on the like culture shifting projects that the city could take on. Or there's a lot of things that are going to be actions that are in the climate action plan that are going to be related to, um, you know, trying to do a feasibility study for uh, like a tree ordinance for trying to protect trees for, when new construction goes on or, or canopy and and um, kind of a culture shifting climate week and things like that. So it's kind of just a broad, looking at it in a broader way than just explicitly reducing fossil fuel emissions, if that makes sense. Um, and also, a, they would. we're hoping it might support a grant to work with developers <laughs> to help them, you know, get to, to make this process a little less onerous by you know providing support it's one of the grants that we were thinking we might try to get the aspects of the of the actions within the climate action plan is trying to provide educational opportunities for developers for trying to make sense of the existing stretch code and the opt-in code and whatever changes come in the future um explicit projects that i would hope that this new grant program would be able to support one of them is a heat pump pro conversion program that we've been working on with mass cc and dur directly and the city of northampton it's just in its infancy stages, but basically the city of East Hampton was granted through the settlement with the Columbia gas explosions that happened in Lawrence a number of years ago. So, mm -hmm. so we, that settlement allotted a, just a one-time lump sum to go to be split between Northampton and East Hampton for helping people convert to heat pumps. Um, and so we've been working with Mass CEC and DLER to kind of develop this this kind of concierge service that will hold people's hands through the process from the start to the end of getting a heat pump and taking advantage of all the incentives that are currently available. The confusion and difficulty navigating that process, the incentives is something that, that, that residents have experienced all over the state. It's something that we heard explicitly people com complaining about and citing as a barrier for them making these green changes in our climate action workshops that we've had thus far with residents. And to the survey, and the money that we are going to get right now is it's it's not there's not very much money. They, so it's a but fine we're hoping amount. that if we can, this is sort of our um, our attempt to figure it out, and then if we could get a grant as a uh, climate leader community, we could yeah. actually continue it. So that's what I'm trying to say is that yeah. we, we we that's something that's going to happen. We're going to have it, but it's only only going to be able to be implemented to a very small number of households, um, and we're going to be working with a with a consultant and the state to do that. But once that money is, is up, how could we potentially keep it going? Because to reach our climate goals, we a focus on helping residents make that conversion will be critical. So that's a specific example, unfortunately, without specific numbers. So I know you're talking about specific grant money so that would be available. Unfortunately, I can't say yet what that would be and what the numbers for those grant opportunities would be. So, Mike, I see your hand, but just just one second. Um, and I know you have to go, and I'm cognizant of the time. I do want us to get to a. Um, I think we're at a deadline, and there might be an opportunity for us to meet this July deadline. And so, I'd like for us to think about what are the remaining questions, so that we can come back and kind of ask those questions. But, Mike, I want to go to you. I know you're you have to leave here shortly. Yeah, but thank you. I I do have to get on this next Zoom call here. Um, very much for your time and this was you know this is good to, to weed all this this out um i guess the only comment that i could mention right now is i mean is there a way to have this at another hearing or how do you how are you going to leave this yep so we're going to have we'll have another meeting um and again I, like i said i think we have this july deadline and if we can if we have some remaining questions that we have that we can try to answer or figure out what the impact of that would be, I think that would be a, a good way for us to be able to make a decision of whether or not we can move forward with the July deadline. Um, and so I, I know you have to hop off. Can so. I just ask like one quick question before we start? Yep. I, just, I, just, I was looking at, at the sheet that explains the, um, the efficiency requirements. And if a building is all electric, the hers oh, should be, oh darn, because I wanted to ask them. So hers should be 45. Well, BJ, you can probably answer this. What's, what's the distinction between hers 45 in all electric building and passive house? I mean, they're not the same thing, but are, do, would they also require, you know, these special three pane windows and like, what is the difference? And that's what's so hard to break down. It depends on the structure, the use. It's all yeah. wrapped up together, so it's not. A and, and I guess the architect depends, but the art, but there is some. But they present. There is some flexibility there, but hers forty-five is a pretty 
low number, wow. obviously. Yes, I agree. Yeah. 100%. But, but again, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a passive house in that you have to, you know, the passive house people have to give you the, you but know. But this is what happens. I mean, this is yeah. what, it happened when the stretch code first came about too. Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, I'm going to have to do double. Oh, well, not double, but I was trying to think of some of the things that contractors, you know, they were the caulking between each bay, you know, with, right. and they were like, this is just extra work. And then we're putting insulate, you know, it, yeah. it was just, everyone gets so, it seems like um, stuck on one item or the other when this is a big picture mm-hmm. yeah. and we have to know all the pieces in the big picture to, yeah. to, to tell you how to reach that goal. I mean, I do think in a legitimate argument from a developer's point of view is if you're building in Wellesley, and you are, are spending extra money to put all of these things into place, you're gonna you're gonna have customers who will be who will buy whatever you're charging. And this is who's that's, and that's and not that's necessarily of, true as you get further west. And isn't that always been the thing? Boston drives it all, and we're right. sitting over here in Western Mass. And yeah. I'm not trying to yeah. <laughs> stick any dust up, please. Yeah, no, but I'm just. I, I, I mean, I'm reporting. I, 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 can, I, I can understand but, what he was saying that you know, if, if you're saying what may not feel seem as as big an increase in costs in Boston can be really significant here in terms of, of what day. they can realistically yeah. yes. do. Yes. And yeah. I think it's it's we we need to acknowledge that and think about how to address that, I think, what, right. what that would really mean for the developers. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. <laughs> Remaining questions that we have. I mean I think there's a lot, right? Yeah. And but I want us to like I this July deadline is important. And if we can get some of these questions answered and we can still help the city to achieve this goal, I think that we should, should try to do that. But I, I think one, you know, one of the, the critical pieces here that we haven't um, been able to hear from yet is the school reuse uh, folks, mm-hmm. um, those developers. And and because when we were going through that project <clears throat> and the, you know, the selection phase, I mean, really it, it's, <laughs> Um, that piece I think is important because I, I know there was a there was a potential piece for a new building at Maple Street that would be new construction, so that's one kind of variable. Um, and they weren't I, like that was just one of the proposals, but nothing was set in stone. We just kind of when we chose, we chose based on the information that we had available at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that would be a, 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 you know like even though I've, I've, I hear that it's not necessarily for. Um, Existing buildings. I want. I need a thousand percent confirmation of that before I would pass this. Okay. How would we get? What would we? What would make you satisfied that we gotten that information? How would we? How are we going to do that? What does a thousand percent look like? A thousand percent looks like a confirmation from the the uh, DOER that this does not apply to existing buildings regardless of size. Okay. One of the things that I would try to do and he wasn't available was to have the um, regional coordinator, his name's Chris Mason. Okay. Basically, he's like our our regional person for DOER, if that makes sense. And so he's been able to answer my, a lot of my questions leading up to today, but uh, he wasn't available tonight, unfortunately, mm-hmm. but I think he would be willing to go to come to a future meeting. I think that would be earlier. Be good. Be good. Be good. Better. Oh. And I think another piece that we haven't talked about yet is like what is this potentially look for, I mean, like this, you know, this project isn't in the stages yet, but what could this potentially look like for the, you know, the old farm, the Oliver Street boarding mm-hmm, house? Mm-hmm. Is that going to have an addition on it or is that just going to be yeah. a renovated? Yeah. Well, yeah. Because the addition, that would. That would be, that's what, that's, so I just want to make sure that we're, you know, casting a wide net mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that we're potentially identifying all the projects that could be impacted and that we're not, you know, hastily jumping into this for a nebulous, you know, again, and and this isn't, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, so I understand like the importance of grants and the importance of like, you know, but we don't know what those grants are. Sure. Yep. And we don't know what type of opportunity those grants are going to give us. We don't know if it's, so if we stall out critical programs that are providing affordable housing in East Hampton for a grant that we might get, like we have to, we have to be careful, you know, and, and um, you could not find someone who is more in favor of making sure that we are sustainable and, you know, um, environmentally sound moving forward. Cause I was the, I was the guy from the get go who wrote the, the grant that uh, wrote the um, ordinance that allowed us to become a, the first green city. 
right? And or we're one of so the. So you're the guy. I'm the guy. <laughs> so I, I and agree. we have to rewrite that the for the the vehicle ordinance. Can I just say I I understand what you're saying, but the bottom line is we are in the throes of a climate crisis. Oh, absolutely. And the bottom line is we have to get rid of greenhouse gas emissions and. You know, I really do think it's important to, to understand that this is an emergency situation, and we're talking about a lot of construction, a lot of people living in in this wonderful affordable housing that we're talking about. But you know, we want them to have access to healthy environments, and we want to stave off destruction if we don't get rid of greenhouse gases. And I mean, I, you know, that is an important element of why the specialized code exists. Mm -hmm. It's because we are in a crisis as, as a, a, on earth. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be sure we keep that in mind when we're talking. When we're talking I, I, about I agree 100%. Issues. I agree. But I, you know, I think, I mean, they, like, there's some, you know, if, if we're looking at the projects that we're talking about, um, we're talking about projects that are going to be some of the most, uh, you know, green projects that East Hampton's ever seen already. Um, you know, I, I, I listen, if we, if we want to, if, you know, with the climate emergency, we, we passed that, that was, I was one of the ones put forward. Yep. I appreciated you know, that. Um, you know, honestly, we should, we should look at telling people in East Hampton they shouldn't eat meat. I mean, we should look at restaurants, like giving restaurants incentives for not serving meat. I mean, really, well, if we wanted to make a big, go off no, I'm just, I'm just saying like, if we're going to like, it, like we want a real, a real impact. Well, a real impact. You like know, that's, you know, like if you, we if would have to go. If we housing want a real housing impact, is, a, is a huge element of greenhouse gases. It's a huge piece of the problem. Yep. Housing and yeah. transportation are the two biggies. So, uh, or, and more agriculture, I think, would, would be so so that's bigger we're, than transportation. Reel this back in. Yeah, Let's reel this back in. Animal agriculture? So, yeah. No, it's bigger than transportation. It's huge. All come up. It's huge. Um, yeah. So the school reuse, can you reach out to those folks to... Uh, I can try. I can try. All right. I mean, you've worked with them before. You yeah. It, it's there's. It's just a um. Yeah, I can try. <laughs> can I will try. do my best. All right. I will reach out about town lodging and just to That's, have that, that would be conversation. Good I will also reach out unless someone else wants to reach out. I I want to come back to um. Uh, could, no, um, uh, Three, Julia, Julia, three eighty five Main Street, and, and yeah. would that would that is that the Tasty Top project? No, no, that's three eighty five Main. Mm -hmm. It's a project between uh, Kester, it's like a forty Kester and Kester Land Trust and Tasty Top is at ninety three oh, North Main Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's who Julia was with. I forgot is about Main that Street. One. And I want to touch base with you about the grants, yeah. right? So that what does that really look like? Yeah. Are there other questions that are outstanding that we want to be able to explore to be able to make an informed decision? Well, the only thing I'm wondering about is I know that there's a developer in Northampton who um, gives presentations period periodically. He builds, um, I guess he builds, I don't know if they're passive houses or whatever, but he's a big enthusiast. Mm -hmm. And his, I know his last name is Wright. Have you ever? Wright Builders? Uh, yeah. I don't, I, and... I'm just wondering Jonathan. if if it Did would be touch, useful. To, Jonathan, I, you, I, think I'm just wondering if it would be it. useful to have him if he if he was available to come to a meeting to talk about his experiences building. I don't know, and then I, it would be great if Chris meet if we could have a meeting that Chris Mason could come to because he could answer all of the DOER questions. I mean, I mean he just knows all this stuff. Yes. Mm. Honey, That's what he does for a other, living. <laughs> one other thing I think is important for us to know is um, if we pass this, what is um, the grace period? The uh, like, how can we give twenty four months? What, what, is like, what, what is is there a window there because i heard six to 12 but I, I feel like, like that might have been state, just i think the state i don't know if it's actually a mandate but it seems like they expect it to be six, six. months yeah that's what i've all i mean generally it's six yeah so do we have flexibility i think would be a question i think that i mean i i've always yeah. run on the note that you can be more restrictive but not less restrictive that's yeah so i i just think that you could extend it if, if it is set at six, you could say we're going to do it in three. Right. Okay, we're going to do it in 12. 12. From right. what I have in this. But again, that's, that would be good for us. Right? Yeah. This presentation that the, the, the DOR gave on this section of adopting the opt-in specialized code said 
um, recommended six to 12 months after adoption. So that's like a range and it says recommended. So uh, that's something I can yeah, ask so, Chris Mason about. So maybe there is no set. That's oh, no. just yeah. a, what they put out there yeah. because I'm not, I'm not, I've been doing 18 years, the building code, and I yeah. can't say that I've ever known. Is it mandatory? Is that set in stone? Mm -hmm. I, I, and do I'm they check? Gonna, Right, and do they, right. <laughs> I've given anyone no, 18 years experience. <laughs> but okay. I, think, I think that that makes sense. And I, I think that's a probably really critical piece because it's maybe the, the, the middle, there would be a, a really good sweet spot to hit where it's like, okay, maybe we can get to a place where all of our questions are answered and we can adopt, mm -hmm. vote to adopt the opt-in code, but find a really good effective date yeah. that can be benef that can kind of help these projects that I, I really understand and hear your piece is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a way we can strike a sweet spot that we get all the things. No, <laughs> I think, I think but I also, in the middle. Yeah. That's, right. that's, that's good. Good. Yeah, We that's don't want to good. sabotage just, any of these developers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, already in process. My God. No. No. We want this development. development. I, we want <laughs> this to, yeah. you know, but we also, I think, all are in agreement that we want to try to keep working toward, you know, improving our climate yeah problems and and by doing so this is one of the solutions of helping yeah. that so i don't i think we want to do it it's just we want to make sure that we are being aware of all the players or all the people that are involved and could be affected and what giving them a, a lead time yeah. so that they can adjust to it yeah. yeah well i mean it's just like at this moment in in east hampton's history we have some pretty important projects that are happening mm -hmm. pretty ground i mean the Kestrel mm -hmm. one which i forgot about is like that's never been done that's like you know a conservation and affordable housing together at one like we don't want to so, you know, I think that that's the piece, right? We figure out the way that we can make sure that we can protect the environment, address the fact that we're in a, a crisis right now, but also help, you know, push these developments up that we haven't had anything like these. I mean, I've been waiting for 20 years for Ferry Street to get redone. I mean, that's like, <laughs> but we was, all I ran on what, saying Ferry Street needs to get redone. Drop. What, what is that deal breaker? You know, right. how far, you know, that's what we need to establish mm -hmm. and then know for sure some of these areas that aren't, that aren't, that we don't have. Yeah, and let's hope the, D, the state actually does have all the information for the upgrade of the stretch code when they say they're going to. Let's Good luck with that. Yeah. You know, I've been asking about this. New I know. I know. So, BJ, that's on you. Yeah. <laughs> You're in the hot seat. Yeah, talk to somebody, will you? Uh, honey, you know? will you, will you um, send me a text or an email telling me to reach out to the school people? Oh, okay. <laughs> Just to like, I, I had a feeling he was talking to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was giving me directions. I'm sorry. So Councilor Dunham. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. So we need to schedule another meeting, but Tamara is now off. So I'm going to send a text message. So hopefully it can happen sooner than later. Uh, and then and I can inform everybody else so that, that you all can can try to be here and a part of this conversation. And it would be great if we could find out when Chris Mason is available. Well, exactly. I know at least right now that he's away from today oh, okay. until May 6th. Oh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So... Good to know. Sorry. Yeah. But that's 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 what I got as a bounce back message today. So, okay. <laughs> so let's look no, I towards. can reach out and see if there's another person. It's from true. The state. Well, there yeah, there there are other regional coordinators. Right. So maybe it's appropriate to ask another region coordinator, but I don't know how do you how do you guys feel about that? Because I don't know what the difference is between our coordinator versus the central mass coordinator. Well, I mean, Chris versus... knows this area so well because yeah. exactly. he's yes. him. Yes. I mean, he is sort of an ideal person, right. but um when's he gonna be back? I think May they yeah, So we have till what is the deadline? July. Well, I think this is when the applications are due for the first round of climate mm -hmm. leader designation. Um, okay. So what's when's our first meeting in July? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll look. <laughs> uh, our first meeting in July would be the third. All right. So do we want to? So if we try to meet after May six, that will give us time. We'll give us time to do our research. To do this research. And then I do want us to be as supportive as possible. To have, if we can make this happen, that would be that would be great, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's to keep emphasizing that we could set, you know, we could find out how long yeah. we're going to opt in on it, mm -hmm. hypothetically, or yeah. you know, and then we could once we find we can set, once we find out. Can we extend it 12 months, 24 mm -hmm. months, and so we can opt in now to or, be in the, out of the gate with everyone else 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's probably an important. Or also area. just like if, if, if developers are at a certain point in their process, even if they don't have their permits yet, would they be given that extra time extra as opposed time. to new developers coming in? Yeah, all I kinds of questions. To see like how that. that. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah these are very. I, I've not been. At, I'm not gonna. You know, I'll go find the answer for yeah. you, but I, I can't give it to you. Oh, you I, I didn't. Yes, yeah, but you know, I, I'll yeah. find it. I mean, I just, I, you know, I. It's always. The energy portion of enforcement for me has always been, you know, I go to class after class just trying to understand it, you know, when the stretch code came out. And it was a requirement for all of us to have so many hours in our 45 credit hours that we have to maintain to keep a commission yeah. to have a portion of it be about energy. And, and you know, I, it's you go to these classes and it's it's sort of like everyone's doing exactly what all of you are doing. Well, what about this? And I've read this. And, yeah. and then you have all the interpretation of this. It's the same wording, but yeah. everyone can interpret it different mm -hmm. too. So yeah. it's really hard to get, I think, to make it crystal clear. And and I, it's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I... <laughs> I, I can see how difficult it is. It is. You know, because give me the building code. I love it now. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, you know, you get the energy code in there. It's, 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 it's something to navigate. Mm. Yeah. So this was a great conversation. I think it was like trying to figure out where everyone and everyone understood about this. And I think we kind of got some answers, right, in terms of kind of understanding this a little bit better. So, um we will work on a date after May 6th. I will keep all of you informed of what that Thank date you. is to try to make sure that you can all be available. Um, and then we'll go from there. So um, I'll take a motion. So move. Second. <laughs> good. So I can go right. Yeah. And Aye. all in favor? <laughs>